The, the question was um, uh, regarding the prison abolition movement. Uh, um, actually, prison abolition has a very long history, which I don't have time to um, rehearse at this point. Uh, but, but I would say that um, in the last period, in the U.S., we have discovered that it is, um, it is possible to have serious conversations about prison abolition in the larger public sphere. Uh, many of us have been talking about prison abolition for a long time, uh, um, but we were considered, um, you know, absolutely crazy. Yeah, can, um, uh, and people just didn't take, take us seriously. Now, uh, the, the, the fact that um, the reforms have not worked over generations, many people are aware of this. Uh, so they're receptive to conversations about, first of all, how to reduce the prison population. Uh, because abolition is a, is a complicated process. It's not simply about abolishing prisons. It's about creating a society that no longer needs to rely on these institutions of, of, of repression. And I think that uh, particularly given this historical moment, more people are are willing to entertain the idea that we need radical social change, that capitalism is not working, privatization is not working, neoliberalism is not working. Uh, um, and, and also the question of um, the nature of justice uh, and the possibility of uh, a very different approach to justice, an approach to justice that does not um, require retribution that is not uh, grounded in precisely the violence that one attempts to address. Uh, so restorative justice, um, uh, that is uh, a movement that is growing. Uh, transformative justice, uh, so there are different elements. Uh, they're, they're educators and uh, teachers and parents who are interested in the, in the impact of the prison system on the educational system. So I would say the abolition movement has had an impact, uh, a broad impact, not only with respect to uh, the specific institution of prisons. Uh, in the UK, there is... Uh, a growing abolition movement uh, in Australia. Uh, abolition has been uh, uh, addressed in some parts of Africa, in Nigeria, you know, for example. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm actually impressed that uh, within a relatively short period of time, I, I would say in, in the last two decades, in the last 20 years, uh, I think that we've made a great deal of progress in terms of um, placing abolition on um, social justice agendas. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm very happy to hear that you're having a conference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, now, how difficult do you think it is to challenge the idea of imprisonment in a society which has learned to confuse the safety with the existence of prisons? Well, again, this requires uh, a broad public conversation on the nature of security. Uh, and, and this requires us to think much more broadly about security uh, uh, as opposed to security that is anchored in violence. Uh, you know, how can we expect to um, become a secure through methods that are precisely grounded in the violence that, that we perceive as threatening our security. 
So security also means jobs. Security also means education. Security also, I mean, security uh, 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 for uh, immigrants and refugees and the families, the issues that you were talking about. Uh, uh, so I think that if you encourage that broader discussion, uh, people uh, begin to recognize how narrowly the notion of security is addressed uh, when it's confined to institutions like the police and prisons. The question about abolition. As I think I said last night, uh, one of the major resistance, resistances to abolition was precisely uh, from feminist circles who uh, argued that, what, well, what are we going to do with the perpetrators of, of male violence? Uh, uh, prison abolition does not assume that people who commit uh, acts of harm and especially uh, gender violence will not be dealt with. Uh, what we try to highlight is the fact that we have lost the sense that it is possible to address uh, perpetrators of harm in any other way than to send them to prison. And what happens when they go into uh, an institution that is anchored in violence, uh, uh, you know, first of all, most of the time, they're not really made accountable for what they do. No, uh, once they go to prison, everybody forgets about it. And they enter a violent environment. Uh, unconceivably, they become even more violent than they were when they went in. So when they are released, they probably engage in even more violence. So that's the contradiction. That's what we're asked to address. And, and so abolition asks us to imagine the possibility of eradicating gender violence. Uh, how can we eventually rid our planet of this most pandemic form of violence? Uh, uh, over the last 40 years, 45 years or so, uh, since uh, feminist consciousness regarding violence has uh, emerged and flourished and developed all over the world. There have been many, many institutions that have been created, uh, you know, from rape crisis centers to shelters uh, to efforts to criminalize uh, acts of gender violence. Uh, uh, some perpetrators have been incarcerated, uh, but in all of this, the incidence of gender violence remains exactly the same, despite the fact that in some places it has been criminalized and people have been sent to prison. So an abolitionist approach asks us to think seriously about what might be required to rid the world of violence. Uh, uh, and some movements and organizations have taken this very seriously. Uh, there, is a, there is a group uh, uh, that's called uh, Creative Interventions. Uh, another group that's called um, uh, Generation Five. Uh, and some of these organizations take seriously the fact that it is that if we really want to purge our worlds of this violence, it's going to take a long time. There is no immediate solution. Uh, if, um, if simply sending a person to prison is not going to address the problem as a whole, uh, then perhaps we have to think about long-range solutions. Uh, so Generation 5 is a very interesting organization. Uh, and what they argue is that it's going to take five generations to uh, truly purge our societies uh, of this problem. And that 
It can only happen if people work together. People who are the abusers work together with the abused. So the organization, um, it's very interesting. In order to be a member of the organization, you either have to be an abuser or you have to be someone who's abused. And the very, the very fact of working together is something that uh, is so uh, contradictory to what we've all been taught. Uh, that the, 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 the way you get rid of violence is to, to get rid of the perpetrator, put the perpetrator in prison, and then you forget about it, and the violence continues, the cycle continues. Uh, uh, and it's true that, um, that this violence is cyclical, that it, it moves from one generation to the next uh, uh, in ways that uh, are uh, you know, often not so perceptible. Uh, but it is usually the case that uh, people who engage in this kind of violence have been the targets of violence themselves. I'm not saying everyone who's been the target of that kind of violence is going to become an abuser. No, that's not the case. But virtually everyone who is an abuser has uh, a background, a history of having been abused. Uh, um, and so the, the, the question is, you know, what can we do to get rid of this, 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 this cycle? Prisons don't, not only uh, don't help us to abolish that cycle, but prisons contribute to it. Uh, um, and, and so, um, well, I was speaking about Generation 5. Their argument is that it's going to take five generations. And they have a strategy that, and we don't usually think about political strategies as uh, uh, having a timeline that's longer than maybe, well, there's a five-year plan, right? So if a five-year plan is about as far as, yeah, you have a four-year four four plan, okay. But, you know, what if we had a 100-year plan? And we started to do the work now that would depend on others uh, to um, complete. And I, I think that only uh, a strategy like that is going to get, get rid of racism and get rid of violence. Uh, we can't assume that there are any easy solutions. Prison is a solution that's much too easy. Uh, and it always complicates those problems that it presumes to solve. Uh, uh, so that's the long year, and that's the, 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 the long durée, right? Uh, and then there are, of course, ways in which we can, uh, as I was referring to before, uh, develop uh, community responses. We don't always have to assume that the best response is to call the police and, 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 and send the person to prison. Uh, you know, what if uh, uh, this, this man who is the abuser was compelled to uh, um, educate other men about uh, the role that, 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 that men have played in perpetrating this horrendous uh, uh, violence against uh, uh, women. Now, what if we think about some other, you know, some other uh, ways of guaranteeing that the person would not become a perpetrator again, uh, but at the same time guaranteeing that um, there's a, a broader impact uh, so thank you for your work. Uh, and I think this is an open conversation uh, that we have to be willing to engage in uh, if we do want to make a significant contribution to uh, the issue of uh, eventually <coughs> abolishing gender violence. Mm -hmm.